it is a world of embarrassment. Crazy. It is a complete world of embarrassment, but we're horrible. thrilled to be here. Absolutely horrible, but it's wonderful at the same time. Um, we have a wonderful show in store for us today, but before we get into that, first of all, like I do every week, I want to thank the great folks here at Riverview Studios. If you have any filming needs at all, come to the studio, check out the interior, walk along the Delaware River for the exterior. It's beautiful here, but more important than the facilities are the great and talented people who work here. It's just a wonderful, there we go. It's a wonderful facility. Um, we've had some fun here today. You guys got to watch a horrific video. Um, we have a dear old friend, at least of mine and of many people who watch the show with us, um, Todd Yasui. Todd, thank you for coming. Thanks, Davey. So we have all sorts of things to talk about. You're a TV producer in LA. I, I can't remember. I've known you for 36 years. I can't remember all the things. So we have them typewritten here. Um, but before we get into any of that, yes. you know our tradition here on Guitar Tales. It has something to do with Bon Jovi. Yes, so okay. we, we play Six Degrees of John Bon Jovi. I would guess that you have probably 30 ways to get there. I might have met Bon Jovi. So that would be one degree, is that correct? Under our rules, it would be zero degrees. Zero degrees, okay. Yeah. So I honestly don't recall. Okay. Um, and it sounds stupid and it sounds arrogant, but just over the years, I've run into a lot of them and I'm sure he has done one of the shows I've done. Right. So I'm sure I've talked to him and met him, but I honestly don't remember. But I've met a lot of musicians who probably played with him. So can I have a zero degree and like a 34th degree? Right, so what we're gonna it? do, we're gonna give you an unofficial written in pencil winner trophy oh. right now. Take it. And again, there's, there's one person, and I always say this, is one person who could beat you now, and you're 40 miles away in Rumson, so, you know, I'm just saying. Right. So. Okay. So, um, yes, I might have met Bon Jovi. I don't remember. Okay. So, take us a slightly circuitous way there. Yes. Um, okay. Um, I met uh, a guy who played drums uh, with his bass player once. I, I don't know. Oh, I'm that's, stretching. That's really lame. I'm stretching. That's really lame. That You're tired. Lame. You're tired. You just got off a of red eye. I, I did. Know it. Yeah, I got off a of red eye, so I don't. I normally look ten years younger. You could put your glasses on. You were threatened to do that. Let me let me give you guys a little history. So, if you've watched our show before, you hear the really bad outro music. The, I think it's good drumming. He'll say it's bad drumming. Is Todd? I've known Todd for 36 years. We've played in really, not great, but okay bands. Over Crappy the years. cover bands. Yeah. With three originals, three originals. Three originals. Yes, I wrote one, you wrote one and a half, Yes, I think. So I've known Todd for 36 years, and really a lot of our banter about music was my inspiration to get this show started and off the ground. In addition to my old band with Scott Engel, who's our now publicist, you have an amazing story, and we're gonna try to cram a lot um, into maybe half hour, 35 minutes of show. We should point out that even though the, the show is called Guitar Tales, I do not play guitar. Right. I and, and don't play. At all. And you tried earlier. Yeah, I did. Now, and, and I, we but might... But isn't this the truth? Because yeah. I've told my kid, if, the, if you know D, C, and G on the guitar, you can play literally, probably, yeah. 50, 60 you old can. rock tunes. I just saw Knocking some... on Heaven's Door. Yeah. I saw, my old band did that. I saw something on YouTube with Ed Sheeran on an interview show, uh, and he said, I will play any pop song in the world in four or fewer chords, and they started challenging him, and he, right. he did it. Right. Um, I want to start right yeah. now for our backstory. You have a very old and weathered 36-year-old index card with you. I do. So, I guess I would have been 19 in college at George right. Washington University, and uh, my roommate and I, I was trying to learn to play drums, I never really played. Uh, Warren, my roommate, played bass, and we were like, we should try to get in a, a band together. And the joke was, I said, well, dude, I am no Neil Peart. I cannot play drums. I'm just learning. I can do basic Charlie Watts, but I can't do uh, anything like Neil Peart right. and everything. And that became a running joke. Right. I said, oh, these guys, someone's going to expect me to be good. And I look at this thing, and it says, musicians, exclamation point. And I like how you wrote in parentheses, we have access to PA. In, in parentheses, which by the way, I think was bull. It was bull, we used yeah. yours. Yeah, because you didn't yeah. have one. Yeah. This is two guitarists looking to form or join band, tasteful classic dance music and original. I didn't write that, Dave Hendricks wrote Prefer that. musicians with integrity, and you underlined integrity, or Dave did, the yeah. other Dave. All that is now necessary is bass and drums, but keyboards can certainly be checked out. No Neil Pertz need apply. 
and then, of course, call Dave Cohen and Dave Hendricks. Right. So I look at that in the student union building. I pull this off. I come back to my roommate, Warren, and I'm going, hey, Warren, we were looking for two guitarists. You know, They're looking for a bass player and a drummer, and I read him this thing. I go, no, Neil Peart's need apply. That's me. I suck. Um, and so we called you. Right. And and but you, he didn't believe it. He didn't believe it. He thought it was a joke. Because and it's I, such a coincidence. Which is why I pulled the card off of the bulletin board. One is, I didn't want you to find another bass player and drummer. And two is, I wanted to show my roommate and go like, hey, look what I found. How, what a coincidence. And he was like, yeah, funny, funny, you wrote that. I'm like, no, I swear I didn't. So we called you. Um, we were at George Washington University. If people that don't know that university, it's an urban university right downtown DC. Right, right, right. It's, there's no space anywhere to practice, to keep instruments. And I used to keep my crappy drum set taken apart in my closet. I don't know if you remember this. You guys came over to our place because I'm I like, I'm not, hang, I'm not bringing my drum kits, loading them up and carrying them piece by piece across campus. So you guys came over. And do you remember the first song we jammed to see if we were compatible? I can't believe you don't Stones. Know. Squeeze Box by The Who. Oh. You know, that um, was cheating on my part because I did that in my Delaware band before I had transferred. Well, you guys told us, like, hey, let's try Squeeze Box. So anyways, we played uh, Squeeze Box by The Who, and I think I was singing and drumming at the same time, and uh, that was how we started we up our little cover band. We didn't take you away from the drum kit and put you in front till senior year. Correct. You were the, we had three iterations of our band, right. and the video that we were just horrified by, but kind of fun, that was the Thurston Block Party. No. The was video it the Madison we saw, party? No, that was oh, a KitchenAid Kitchen Aid. party, which was a benefit I, I organized in college. It was, it was, it was meant to be a, a nice, heartfelt gesture, but I also <clears throat> wanted to have a reason to have a concert at school that we right. could play at. And it was an alcohol-friendly concert. It was. Yeah. It was a blast. It was and a blast. We, we but we were truly a horrible cover band. I mean, we were good for college right. uh, to play at frat parties, which is what we did. So right. eventually, like many, many bands in college, uh, we were fortunate enough to run into those guys. I don't even remember what fraternity it was, but they allowed us Kappa to... Kappa Sig. No, no. Oh, the, oh no. We, Del, the Delt House. The was Delt it? House. The Delt House. So Delta we were... Tell, Delta. They were... It was premium. Space was so premium in right. D.C. where we went to sc uh, school that um, they had a basement and that they had a bar and they would have parties a lot. And they allowed us, if you remember this, to keep our equipment in their, in their basement. basement in exchange for playing at their parties. And, at, on their women, or beck and call, beck and call. Right, right. So whenever yeah. they would have a party, they go, you guys want to play? And we'd go, like, heck yeah. And that, in, in exchange for that, we got to keep our equipment in one place, which at GW was extremely hard. Right, because we were in the music center for a while, and that really wasn't Yeah, and the rooms were small, and no one would let you store stuff. So no. for us, a big part of our, our college uh, band was being playing at, at, at the yeah. frat house. And you remember, um, we were playing right the first day they were allowed to drink, because they were all on the crew team, and they stole the mic from you for Johnny Be Good. They threw you off the stage, and they sang. Uh, yeah, they just kind of drunkenly came up uh, and took over the mic, and yeah, yeah. yeah. So let me do this. Yeah. I want to talk about our, so we, we met, right? We met, we, we, we had our little index card, we started jamming, Sadly, you've brought pictures with you. I did. Um, so this is one I wanted to show everybody, and that is Dave Cohen playing guitar, and I just want to make fun of the headband. You don't know the backstory of the headband. A white headband, but by the way, this is yeah. early 80s, so this would have been, do you know who Mike Reno is? No. The lead singer for Loverboy. Oh, yes. Remember the ubiquitous headband he had? That's not you, a headband, Todd. You have a thing around your head that might be something else that you're about to tell me. Yeah. What is it? It's not even close to, it's so bad. It's so bad. In high Are these school. underwear? It's not quite as bad as that. In high school, I had the poor taste to actually have a mesh shirt that went this far down. It gets worse. And then. The, I wish I had pictures of that. Oh, I'm glad you don't. And the bottom, so it's mesh from, you know, the neck down. The bottom was like the band to a pair of underpants. So having no clothes, I actually, at GW, in college, for that gig, took a pair of scissors and took the bottom of a mesh shirt, and then I created a headband. Wow. Well, it worked for you, Dave. Yeah. I mean, you got the le and the other thing is the leather the jacket sleeves. with the sleeves pushed up. So this would have been around Miami Vice time. And that or Rick Springfield. Earl, 
early 80s, Rick Springfield, where they everyone wore their jacket sleeves pushed up. Yeah. Um, and that's Warren, uh, our bass player, and that's some girl that we all knew. Yeah. It was our first version of a groupie. Um, here's another funny picture of Dave that I took here. And look at that puffy hair. You had some hair back then. I had hair. Right? Yeah, you, I don't know what happened to you. You stayed preserved. I didn't. Uh, I was lucky. But um, yeah, that's you and Warren. And that was at a Thurston block. That was at one of those parties. Right. Now, not to, this is a bad picture. We have some other ones. Let's look at this other picture. Yeah. There's me at a Thurston block party. Looking uh, very which rock was a star. Dorm. Well, you notice all the uh, bandanas. Yeah. So back then, it was like bandanas were a thing. We all had some. We have a picture of uh, Michael Bernstein with yep. a bandana. He's, he's got the a little ponytail player, in the back. Who we're going to see later today. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, of course, Davey, you're on stage in shorts. Which like, is horrific. And they're not just shorts. They're non-long shorts. They're it's, like OP or something was yeah, like the name of horrible. them or something. They were those, literally those OPs. Shorts, they were but, literally um, OPs, yeah. Yeah, that was that was fun, playing in a, in a crappy cover band in, in college. It was. And, you know, the whole point of this show, it, it, we started this, it's Guitar Tales, it's, you know, yeah, we could listen and we'll do it later in the show today. We'll, t we'll hear the tales of famous, successful musicians, yeah. but there's a backstory to people whose lives have just had amateur and, and more so, because we've, we've had on the show, we've had very successful musicians, mm -hmm. but our, the root of the show are the stories that you might not have heard. That's what Scott Engel always talks about, you know, right, the right. tales of guitar players you might not have heard. Right, right. And, and these, these are stories that are beautiful to us. We share them with our kids who have zero interest in them. Oh, yeah. Like I, showed, I showed a, a VHS tape of, of us playing somewhere to my kids. And they were just horrified. No, and, and, and no patience <laughs> for something that has such low production and content value. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so. um, but it, look, it was all fun. And I've never did, been in an originals band, really. I've always done cover tunes because right. I can't write. And I, you know, I pretend to sing, but it's, it's more like shouting. Um, but who cares? This is what I, I say to people, you know, when I would have someone tease me about, oh, my God, you know, like, you're still doing rock stuff? That's so stupid. And I'm like, look, no one makes fun of the guy who goes out on the weekend to play with his company softball team. Right. It's like, he's not playing company softball team because he thinks he's going to play in the major leagues. He's doing it because it's fun. Right. It's like, when I get together with my friends, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how bad of a player you are, when you get a bunch of people together to play music, it's a hobby. It's fun. I don't spend 15 hours on a weekend playing golf. I don't go out and play tennis. I don't gamble. So it's like, what's so fun? Oh, making music, no matter how bad it is. So I always encourage people, I go, don't let anyone ever tell you it's stupid or that it's lame or whatever. Just have fun. That's absolutely you know, it. You don't, you don't go paint because you think you're going to make a living as a painter. You do it because it makes you feel good. Right. And um, so even now, today, my friends and I will get together every once in a while. And let's just make some noise. You have an amazing story that we really have to abbreviate, but yeah. you went from GW. Yes. You started working for the Washington Post. You stayed in bands afterwards. Yes. Um, but you end up in LA. Give us the elevator speech version of how that happened. So yes, so when you and I left GW, two weeks out of college, I got a job at the Washington Post, um, just answering phones, sorting mail. Within two weeks of that, of starting, I was, so I was a month out of college, uh, the music reviewer, uh, if the Washington Post saw me working on a Sunday, there was no one in the newsroom. I was there just in case the phones rang. Uh, and he sent me out. He said, uh, I had long hair back then. Right. And he said, do you want to go review a concert? Do you know how to write? Have you ever written before? And I said, well, I just graduated. I've written college papers. He goes, go, go, go review this band for me. I, it's a, I don't want to go. And he goes, oh, you're too young. You're not going to know the mamas and the papas. And I'm like, I know the mamas and papas. Right. California Dreamin', John Phillips, everything. So I went out and did that review, and uh, it, they actually published it. So a month out of college, I got my first review in the Washington Post for music, and from that point on, for the next six years, he just gave me every single concert he didn't want to review. So that's where my, my music tales come in, was there at the Post. But then I moved, uh, I, I took a dare from a friend, um, made a call to Jay Leno's manager, cold called her, as a dare and, and a joke. And, and this is right when Johnny was leaving and Jay was starting. Correct. And so she hired me over the phone to come work uh, on the, the Tonight Show with Jay Leno uh, as a talent executive booker. So I would book people on the Tonight Show. And you would do the pre-interviews. It, yeah. it's, not, it's not just lining someone up. You would 
spent correct, time correct. With. I got promoted to that six months after I was at The Tonight Show into a segment producer. So what you do is you call people up, they have a project coming up, whether it's a band, TV show, movie, you talk to their publicist and you say, hey, come do our show instead of Letterman. Come do our show instead of whatever. Um, and then they say yes, and then you go, okay, I'll interview them before they come on, so Jay has some talking points. So either the bands, comedians, or actors, or sports stars would come on the show. I would interview them uh, before they came on the show, find out what their talking points were, and then I would write up the interview uh, for Jay. So that's right. how I got to meet and mingle with all these people. What a good segue, because I have, I have my notes from you right here. Yeah. <laughs> Last night you sent me all sorts of great notes. There's so much here, and I know why you wrote it, partly because it's what you do for a living and mm -hmm. partly because there's so much here. I can't possibly memorize all of this. But so in your job as a segment producer, it would be really fun to talk about Bobcat Gulfway and all the crazy people you've had on. Bobcat's the name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were Bobcat, a lot of crazy. Because I went out and I watched him burn his couch. Oh, you came couch. to visit me when, you, when yeah. Bobcat was on the show. When right. he burned his couch. Right. I watched that live. But anyway, and there's a million stories there, but yeah. here you are on Guitar Tales. The quantity on this list, we won't be able to come anywhere near okay. the, the full breadth of this list, but okay. you have interacted with some amazing musicians, guitar players, and otherwise. Yes. So there's a story behind all of them. I have a partial list here, and, and it's crazy. Just give us anecdotes as we go through them. You know my favorite. Uh, I just hit my mic there. Um, Pete Townsend. Yes, from you, The Who. You've met him. Yes, and Daltrey. So what was weird is that... Uh, the Who were on a hiatus. This would have been early 90s. Okay. And uh, Daltrey came on the show to do, you know, you, Daltrey's whole thing was like Daltrey sings Townsend. He would yeah, label his that. tours differently. Yeah. Um, but it was all the same. It's like, well, when haven't you been singing Townsend songs? Right, right. So he came on The Tonight Show um, for one of those projects, and he was singing Who songs, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, so I got to uh, you know interview him and and super nice time guy, I would imagine. Probably one of the nicest guys in rock that I've met. Right. So down to earth, was hanging out all day. Um, told me a story about finding out at age back then he was probably in his fifties, but he had he had found out within the last year that he had another kid that he didn't know about. Oh my god! He has like eight kids or something. Okay. Um, and I was like, well, that must have been weird because the kid was like in his 20s or something. And right. he was like, no, it was great. I love it. I love having another kid. He's a positive um, energy guy. So positive energy. And so um, I never did this on a regular basis because in TV, there, and when you're backstage with these celebrities, there's a rule. You don't bother them for pictures or autographs. Right. But when you call them on the phone ahead of time, you're doing the interview, what I would always do is saying, hey, there's some people on the staff that are gonna want autographs, how do you feel about that? Depending on the celebrity, a lot of them will be like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Some, some of them are, would just go like, hey, I yeah. prefer not to, because right. it gets out of hand, depending on who it is. So I had asked Daltrey the day before, hey, you cool, people ask for some autographs. So I brought in my Who's Next vinyl, and uh, he, I'm in his dressing room, and he's like being so chatty and nice, and he signs it, and he's like, hey, do you want John to sign it? And I'm like, and twistle. He was still alive. Yes, yeah. and he was playing with his band wow. that night. And so he walks me down the hall, introduces me to John Entwistle, who signs my Who's Next record. I'm on cloud nine. Um, and then maybe a year later, Townsend came on, okay. um, doing his solo thing, and I brought my Who's Next record. I also brought along the inside poster. For, it might. Quadrophenia. Was, was it Quadrophenia? There's oh, a, there was a picture of Townsend, and I think it's at Woodstock, of him leaping in the air, and it's no, taken from behind. that would be live at Leeds then, probably. Okay, so yeah. I got that signed for you, yeah. which you probably don't even know where it is anymore, but I remember I, I, I specifically could it in my head, yeah. had Townsend sign it for you. Um, but he was not like Daltrey. He was yeah. very intimidating, it, it, very, very quiet. Um, not, not warm, I would he's say. He's a troubled man. I mean, I've, re I've re read his books. Right. He, he's got some issues. Right. Whereas Daltrey got beaten up when he was young, came out on the other side, and came out a very positive man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was great. Let me read for you. We've got a list here. I'm going to read a few of the names for you. Okay. And then I want you to just share with us any anecdotes you might have sure. about these folks. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's too much. Robert Plant, Rod Stewart, Hart, Kiss, The Scorpions, Ted Nugent, Iggy Pop, Cheap Trick, Joe Cocker, Ringo Starr, The Band, Moody Blues, Phil Collins, Sting, Lou Reed, Snoop Dogg, Ray Manzarek, Ozzy, Meatloaf, 
Dave Crosby, Graham Nash, Little Richard, Brian Ferry, Ray Davies. Yeah. Choose. Um, okay, so my hero, Robert Plant, um, he was coming on the show, and I was absolutely n terrified because, you know, I had a Led Zeppelin poster on my wall from the time I was probably 13, and here right. was this guy standing in front of me. Couldn't have been nicer again. Such a sweet guy, and, you know, you think like, oh, what do you talk about with a famous musician that you idolize? He and I talked about property in Oregon. Oh, that's <laughs> because great. Because he was yeah. going to buy some land in Oregon, and I told him that's where my family Hood originated River. in Hood River, and we started talking about Oregon. And it was so cool to just have this conversation with someone that's not anything about music. And we really yeah. got into it about the progressive nature of Oregon as a, and the state government and uh, the land and all that stuff. So he, he couldn't have been cooler. You know, I was watching <coughs> um, Kennedy Honors. They have that... Um, oh, you're right, the John F. Kennedy Honors, yeah. right. He cried. Oh, yeah, when they were playing his music. Yeah. It was, they did Stairway to Heaven. Right. It was Heart. Heart. Right. Mm -hmm. And a Nancy Wilson, and I forgot who else was on guitar. It was right. someone very well known. And you look, they, they, they did a close up, because why wouldn't they? And he's crying with joy. Right. As yeah. He's watching them do it. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, and then, so what was weird about that day was that um, I had two guests on the show that day, which I normally would only have one, but I had George Foreman, the boxer, on the same time as Robert Plant was on. So oddly, I'm in the dressing room talking to Robert Plant, and then he says at one point, you know, would you mind introducing me to George? And I was like, sure, sure. So I walk into George Foreman's room, and he has his like, small entourage there. And I was like, uh, George, I go, um, Robert Plant, the other guest on the show, would like to meet you. Is that cool if I bring him in? And he was like, who's that? I, I knew and, you were going to say and that. I, and yeah. I said, oh, he was the lead singer of Led Zeppelin. And he's like, oh, I don't really know that music. I go. Yeah, it's okay. He just wants to say hi because Plant was a big boxing fan. Oh, right, right. So it was, it was just funny to watch. Did he let him? Yeah, I, I, I go back and get Robert Plant. And I walk in. I go, hey, George, this is Robert and everything. And what's is so funny is he's like, oh, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Robert Plant wanted to take a picture with George Foreman. Wow. Um, and then uh, after they take their picture and everything, he, uh, he goes, George says, hey, I should listen to some of your music. Oh, and they was like, yeah, get George a CD, would you? And it just <laughs> made me laugh, the idea of George Furman getting in his limo afterwards and like taking a Robert Plant CD and listening That's to the song. That's very funny. Um, but that was, it was just, again, the interactions. Another one I thought of was when I had uh, David Crosby on the show. And again, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, hippie era, Woodstock, 50th anniversary, by the way, um, this year. And uh, at the same night, I had Dennis Hopper on. Okay, so two counterculture icons on right. the same show. And the same thing, I'm, I'm in the dressing room talking to David Crosby, and he goes like, uh, hey, Hopper's on the show. Can you take me to see him? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I walked down the hall, knock on the door. But they're the like, same generation. Well, yeah. I, like, it's the same generation. You imagine what those two must have gone through together in the yeah. 60s. Yeah. And so uh, I open the door. I'm like, hey, uh, you know, Dennis, you have an old friend here. And Crosby looks at Hopper, and they look at each other, and he just says, Man, did you ever think we'd live this long? <laughs> <laughs> they just hug each other, and I'm like, that is such a cool moment, because right. either one of those guys could have been a casualty of the 60s. No. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. They, so that was some yeah. of the fun is like when you and meet And that's people, organic, because ex exactly. it's not playing for anyone. Right. Except yeah, for a their podcast interactions 20 years later. When they're alone together, are so much different, again, than anything you'd ever see on TV. Um, I had another uh, thing. And he's a guitarist, so it counts in Guitar Tales, is right. Johnny Depp, right? So Johnny Depp uh, came on the show, and Johnny's an uh, unusual guy, as you yeah. can imagine. He's yeah. very quiet, um, very hard to read and everything. So as a joke, and this is a weird, circuitous story, but I promise it has an ending. So I had gotten a bunch of T-shirts and this won't mean anything. We'll throw up a still store later of who it is. But you know Ernest Borgnine, the old actor. Oh, of course. Yeah. Grumpy old man actor. Right. As When he retired from acting, he was in his 80s, he decided he was going to... He gonna, passed away recently. I don't know how long. I think probably, he did. But yeah. he decided he was going to... This was a real thing. He was going to go on tour across America in a motorhome. Borgnine. Ernest Borgnine, 83-year-old actor from McHale's Navy. And I think He's he won like an Oscar at one point. Tough kind of guy. Right. Yeah. But... Uh, and he was in his 80s and decided he was just going to drive around the United States in a motorhome and put lawn chairs outside and have people come up and just talk to him so that they could meet him. And so his, his manager 
put out these t-shirts that said Ernest Borgnine on tour, and it had a tour bus and a star coming out and Ernest Borgnine's face on it. And it just struck me as the most hysterical thing right. in the world, like unintentionally funny. It sounded like a punk band, right. Ernest Borgnine on tour, right? Yeah. So I had two of these promo t-shirts, and Johnny Depp had never done The Tonight Show before. Notoriously shy interview. And uh, I thought, I gotta do something to make him feel good and thank him for doing the and show. And open him up. Open him up. So yeah. I'm like, I had two of these t-shirts, I'm like, he, he will get this, and he, right. will, he will get the humor in it. So I go to his dressing room and uh, you know, he's smoking a cigarette and nervous and quiet and everything and then we're talking, I'm trying to loosen him up. I'm like, hey, I got a gift from you. This is from my own personal collection and thank you for coming on The Tonight Show. I don't know, you know, I think it's hilarious. And I, I give him the t-shirt and he puts it and he takes it and he looks at it and he puts it down on the couch in the dressing room and he sits there with his cigarette like this, looking at it. And he's just looking at it and he just goes, that's fucking genius. <laughs> <laughs> I was so thrilled that he liked it. Because it could have gone in any direction. It could have gone like, what the hell is this guy giving me? And yeah. he was just, he was so mesmerized. And then right. just goes, this is fucking genius. And I was like, oh, I'm glad you like it. He's like, dude, where did you get these? Where did you get and these? And you gave him the whole backstory. And I was, like, point. Do you, and I was like, I only have one more, which yeah. the second one I gave to Mike Myers from Austin Powers fame for the same reason. I knew he would get it. Right, right. Which he did. They oh, both he thought would it was love hilarious. it even more, I would think. But yeah. the Johnny Depp thing was in the same night I had Johnny Depp on the show, I had David Hasselhoff, right? And Hasselhoff, you, his singing career. Oh, yeah, he's big in Germany. Yeah. He's huge in and Germany. And so yeah. he was actually performing that night on The Tonight Show as a singer. Yeah. And at one point, I'm in Johnny Depp's restaurant, and he was like, hey, man, can you, uh, can you introduce me to David Hasselhoff? Because he, he's iconic in his own weird kind of way. Well, so yeah. we had David Hasselhoff's CDs to promote. Yeah. And uh, Johnny goes, can you, can you get me David Hasselhoff's autograph on my CD? I'm like, well, you come ask him yourself, man. So he I was shy about it. So I take Johnny Depp in to meet Hasselhoff, yeah. and he's like, can you, can you sign this? And uh, so Hasselhoff goes to sign it. He's like, oh, you want to make it to Johnny? He goes, no, make it to Gibby. 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 And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, all right. So uh, he does it and everything. And, I, I kind of, it was one of those moments where it's like, I, I think Hasselhoff, I worked with him a lot, is the most sincere man in the world. I, you know, he was like, oh, Johnny Depp wants my autograph, but it was to Gibby. And I realized later it was for, to, for Gibby Haynes, who was the, the, the leader of the Butthole Surfers. Oh. Um, and so it was one of Johnny's pop punk rock think, fans. Do you think it was in Johnny's head? An ironic gift? Of course, yeah. absolutely. 100%. So he was actually insulting So the he was hop. giving yeah. one of the, you know, preeminent punk godfathers uh, right. a david hasselhoff CD. yeah so there, yeah, it was it was it was actually very disrespectful in retrospect it's a hasselhoff yeah again but i do think there was a genuine affection right. for him but you know and that's what what I mean? interviews. he he's very self-effacing he knows what he is and what he's not completely completely and he takes all that to the bank yes give me some more names give him more names um so ringo Starr. you know me being the biggest beatles fan in the world um, at, this was at a different show. This was at the Late Late Show on CBS that I was producing. And normally I, I had now graduated to be a, an executive producer, so now I had people working for me that did what I used to do. So right. they would interview the guests, write up the interview, brief them, and meet You're going to review it, though. Yes, yeah, I would approve it. But on this case, I said to the staff, sorry, Ringo Starr is coming on. I'm yeah. I'm doing it. You're as a Beatles a fanatic. I'm You've a Beatles fanatic, been, yeah. and I need to meet a Beatle, and so I'm taking this one myself, even though it's not my job anymore. Um, <clears throat> so I get to interview Ringo. It's very cool, and I say to Ringo in the head of time, Ringo, I am going to be inundated with autograph requests. What are you are you cool with that? And he said, uh, Yes, but I'd like to do it all at once in one sitting. So I don't want people coming up all day long doing it. Right. Just collect them and do it in one sitting. So I said, okay, uh, you know, I'll make sure that happens. So of course, I bring in my Sgt. Pepper vinyl, like the original from 67 that I got from my older brother. Right. Um, and then I had tons of people on the staff. You can imagine, oh, can you oh, get yeah. him to sign this, get him to sign that? So he comes that day, and now mind you, you know, Lennon had been murdered, and George Harrison, people don't remember this, but an intruder had broken into George Harrison's home and tried to stab him while he was in bed. I don't remember that. Yeah, that was a big deal. So now you've got two Beatles left. You've got Ringo and Paul. Now imagine what their security must be like right. around those guys, right? Yeah. And the paranoia they must have on an everyday basis. Right. Um, but Ringo's totally cool. And his security guy is a guy not much bigger than me, older gentleman, doesn't look like a big bruiser at all. 
And he comes up to me and he says, listen, just go over some protocol. I was like, sure, whatever you need. He yeah. goes, you know, I, Ringo's gonna stay in his dressing room. I will walk him from dressing room to rehearsal and then I'll walk him back. I'd, I'd prefer if people didn't approach him, only you. Uh, I'd like to have one person that's my contact. And right. I said, that's fine. And by the way, this is so good that you took that, that gig. Oh right? yeah, yeah. I, I mean, even forgetting that your selfish reason I think from a professional point of view, right. as you look at it, that was the better call anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to make sure they were taken care of. So right. uh, so I bring in my pile of stuff for Ringo to sign, and he's very nicely signing it and everything. And then it's like, okay, that's it. No more autographs. So close the door. We're getting ready to do the show. And um, his security guard's standing in front of his door, really mellow, quiet guy. The uh, show's getting ready to start, and I have a staff member who worked at CBS, was not on my staff, but he worked at CBS, comes rushing up to me with a Beatles record. <clears throat> and he's like, Todd, Todd, you gotta get Ringo to sign this for me, please, it's for my son, it's his bar mitzvah coming up, and he's a Beatles fanatic. I'm like, hey man, like, uh, you know, we can't, he doesn't wanna sign anymore, they were really strict about that. And he's like, this guy was sweating because he realized he was late getting right, there to right. get his thing signed. So he was like, come on, oh, you don't know how much this means to him. He's a huge Beatle fan. This is gonna be, I'm like, hey, man, I'm really, I'm serious. I, I, I really can't. And it's a professional boundary. Yeah. I've learned that from my absolutely, friendship with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so the security guard comes over real mellow. He's like, hey, Todd, can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, yeah, no problem. And I walk away and he goes, listen. And he's so calm and fresh. He's like, um, the man you're speaking to, I don't like his vibe. He's a little agitated. I can see he's perspiring. And this is like 20 feet across a hallway, right. you know, yeah. and he's like, and I just don't like his, uh, his body language. Um, do you mind if you kind of walk him away from the dressing room? And I was like, no problem. And then I just, wow. and I said to the guy, I go, look, man, you're freaking out of the security guard. Yeah. No is no. Um, so you gotta be, you know, again, you have to be respectful of their space. And some of them will hang out all day long and talk to you. Some will just hide in their dressing room. It's like, I don't wanna talk until I'm ready to rehearse. But, and it's also, it's a matter, like you're pointing out, it's a matter of personal security. So like you could have people who might be like that because they're arrogant or distant or unappreciative of fans or whatever. Right. You got have people who are shy and we all assume they can't be shy because they're rich and famous, but they still might be shy or they might be worried about being attacked. Right, you know, Ex and, again, uh, you know, I've seen, I've done done so many shows with, with uh, musicians and rock stars and, and rappers. I've done a lot of shows with rappers and everything. And the, the, when you're standing next to them in a, in a public situation or crowd situation, it's a totally different vibe because you realize how dangerous and uncomfortable it can get. Right. So right. I did a music show for YouTube called Sugar uh, last year, and we had um, a Puerto Rican rapper, Bad Bunny. Okay. okay. He's humongous now in the Latin American community, but now he's broken through to mainstream. And we took him to San, uh, to Austin, Texas, and we That's were a great doing great music town. Great music town, and we did an outdoor spontaneous uh, show, like a pop up show, pop up show, right? At, a, at an outdoor food court, and those people mobbed him and were they had like zero regard for his personal space. They, right. they and I was standing next to him. So, you know, the smallest guy in the crew, me, uh, I'm, he had a security guard, but the security guard and I were literally putting our forearms out to push people out of the way. They were reaching over us. They were grabbing his clothes, and it's like, you can see how weird that must be. And, and, and the funny thing is, we're both in our mid-50s. Um, well, when, you are. I went I, down 10 years. You did. You did. You took that off. You paid a lot of money, though. Yeah. Um, when you're really young, when one is really young, that would seem attractive, maybe. I look at that and I think I would never want my life to have ever gone in that. I would not be envious on any level to living that kind of life, no matter how much adulation, no matter how much it fed my frail ego, right. no matter how much money it put in the bank, I would not want that life. Right. That would, I don't think that would be a satisfying life. Yeah, I mean, you can't go, literally cannot go anywhere without being stopped right. or um, bothered or the, the selfies. It, it, it always shocks me having been around so many celebrities, just how bold people are to go up to them. Right. And, you know, and you know, I, I worked with uh, Jay Leno for so many years and he was the nicest guy in the world and it didn't matter. He would sign every autograph, take every picture. And then I've been around others that are just like, it, it, once it starts, it never stops. And it's true, they can't get out, they can't move from point A to point B. And so 
what I like about what you've gotten to understand, live, and experience, really, is that you will see the persona, right? But then when you're doing the pre-interview or as the executive producer stepping in mm -hmm. on a pre-interview, you see the human side. I think we as consumers of entertainment stop seeing them as people. Yes. And I think it's easy to do. There's probably some latent resentment floating around. They're famous, they're wealthy, you know, they have all the extra benefits in life that we don't get. But you see those two different versions of them. Do you and you have to because you see it. You mm -hmm. see them as people. Well, there are and, and there are situations too where, you know, I'm going to meet somebody who's famous that you've known your whole life through movies, TV, music, whatever, and they're exactly like you expected them to be. In a bad way. Good or bad. Okay. You know what okay. I mean? Right. Um, and other people, it's like, oh my God, that is that person is so different than, right, than right. what they're like on stage. It's usually the comedians. You know what I mean? They're probably always more, usually more serious in person. They're not on. They're not on. Definitely. Well, again, it's weird because there's those comedians that are the exact opposite of the way they are on TV. And then there's the ones where they're too on all the time. Right, I, like, I won't name names, but I worked with a really, really, really famous comedian. <laughs> and he just would not turn it off. And we were trying just, to do business. It's right. like I'm trying to produce a show. And so my whole thing was always like, um, while we're riffing about what the show is going to be, I, I'm not going to laugh at all your jokes, but it's not because I don't think they're funny. And I'll say this to them. Yeah. It's like, I'm taking notes and thinking how to execute that. It's positions on the stage. It's how long how you want long the first second is. shorter than the And like, wait a minute, yeah. should we show the, the, the picture there? We should hold it later. Should we do? So I'm thinking. And so I've worked with some comedians where I'm just kind of like straight faced and they're, yeah. they're performing in the pitch meeting and stuff. That's... And it's like, it's weird because yeah. you start laughing and my friend, one of my writer friends and I had a, this famous comedian we were working with, and he just, again, it was just, it got exhausting because they, everything they said was a joke. You couldn't, it's like, we need to talk serious a little bit to get the business part done. And like, we'd laugh. We were with him for a week. And right. the first, the beginning of the week, we're laughing at everything he says and everything. And by the third day, I look over at my friend and I busted him. I go, you're doing the fake laugh because you're not making noise. He's just doing this. <laughs> But but not I, making any noise, I and I'm like, yeah, we're tired of laughing. All if that. that person didn't become a comedian, they would just be the annoying coworker it's in exactly your life it. because they're just it's wired exactly like that, it. and yes. they were fortunate enough to find their way into. Co I, I know lawyers like that. Right. I know lawyers where I think he would be a great sidekick on the Howard Stern show because you're just wired in this wonderfully witty, manic way right. that's very entertaining, and that could translate into a lot of things. But but then you get the comedians who you know have an act. And then in private, they're probably very quiet and serious. Steve Martin. So I, uh, this is not Guitar Tales, but it's, so it's, it's an amusing anecdote. <laughs> um, so I heard a, many, many times that Wait, Steve Martin. He is a good, he plays banjo. Yeah, oh, that's okay. He's a musician. He's that's a, why you a brought banjo it up. Player. That's why I brought it up. Yeah. Um, and he's a good banjo player. Very good. But yeah. uh, so I was, do, I was producing uh, the Queen Latifah's daytime show. And he came on the show with his band uh, to uh, play banjo, and uh, he's uh, famously shy and not really open to the fan greeting thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm walking by his dressing room, and he's sitting there alone on the couch. He's got his banjo, and I'm walking by, and I'm like, okay, he's a comedy hero of mine, but I don't want to bother him. Then I'm like, hey, you know what? Forget that. I'm the producer of the show. I have every right to go in and say hi to him and, and welcome him and right. thank him for doing the show. Um, and so I go to the door, and he's standing, sitting right there, and I kind of knock, and I go, hey, hey, Steve, I'm Todd, I'm the producer of the show, and I start walking towards him, and I swear to God, he pulls a fake one of these. He's like this, he goes, he goes like this. I'll, I'll do that over. <laughs> so I, I go to walk towards him, and to say, hi, I'm Todd, I'm the producer of the show, and he pulls one of these. Oh, hey, hey, how's it going? Yeah, 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 okay, uh-huh. And so I just go, okay, and I back out the room. What he doesn't know is I can see his phone is on lock. So <laughs> Steve Martin totally dissed me with a fake phone call. That's um, great. Because he just didn't want to deal, and I get it. Yeah. I get it. I'm like, all right. And he's a very cerebral space. guy. Like, so, yeah, very yeah, cerebral, yeah. And, and he seems like a kind man, yeah. too. But, you know. yeah. but the musicians, then, are different because they're not trying to be on with their thing. But what I did yeah. notice is a lot of the musicians are just much quieter. Um, and again, they, some of them got into music because they weren't great at 
interacting or talking. Like um, Lou Reed uh, was not a talkative guy at all. In fact, kind of a little surly and grumpy. I would um, think. Right. And so that he, doesn't surprise it me. It doesn't surprise me either. So that's what I was saying about the time where you, somebody is exactly like you think they're going to be. Like, right. I, you know, uh, the guys in Kiss, um, one of them is incredibly warm and nice and welcoming. And that would not be someone named Gene. The other one is not so. <laughs> the other one is more uh, sarcastic and straight to the point and doesn't suffer fools and is like. That would be Gene. Yeah, you can't you say. You name the names, but yeah. Um, so yeah, again, it's like when you meet someone, you're like, oh my God, they're just like I thought they were going to be. That's so cool. They were awesome. And then other ones where it's kind of like, oh, they're kind of, they're an asshole, wow. you know, and it kind of disappoints you. It's like, oh, that was my hero. I, there, there's an old saying about be careful when you meet your heroes. There's a whole thing on volume. They have a show like that. Oh, really? Oh, it's great. It's fabulous. And there's a show, I forgot the title. But it's something like that where they talk about that ex what you just said. You should right. be a producer. Yeah. Uh, but um, they talk about like you know whether you were either you found everything you hoped for in right. meeting your hero or this incredible level of disappointment. Right. And I don't think it's any trunk. It's but it's you know it's one of yeah. those kind of shows. But there you know the, um, the guys again that you 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 expect to be like they are. They've done so much media interviews that you kind of know them already. Like right. Rod Stewart. And uh, Sting, when I worked with Sting, um, he was so funny because he just, he said, listen, he came to the show and he's like, I said, Sting, you didn't, you didn't do a pre-interview with me yesterday, so I have to do one today before the show. And he's like, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. And it's like, I've done this a million times, done a million interviews, right. I don't need you, punk. But I had to, it was my job. And, and so, you can get in trouble if you don't. Yeah, and so after rehearsal, I watched his rehearsal. And I'm like, you know, Sting, is there any way you got two minutes to sit down? And he's like, who are you again? <laughs> and I said, I'm your segment producer. And he goes, segment producer? What the fuck is that? And I go, <laughs> that means I'm uh, doing your pre-interview. He goes, I don't need a pre-interview. Uh, I was like, oh, okay. And Rod Stewart was the same. He was like, I'm not doing this. And this is the day of the show. And I was like, well, Rod, I go, it's fine. I just, you know, like to have the host be able to have some bullet points for you. And he goes, you don't need bullet points. And so the host of the show was like, no, give me something. I need just something. So I wrote up this thing about Rod Stewart. And the notes are on the host's desk. And it was Leno. And Leno's interviewing Rod. And the first question, I had read something about his pets in his house and how it was bugging his wife. And so I gave it to Jay because it was a funny little anecdote for him to tell. And he just goes, what are you looking at? He pulls my notes off Jay's thing and he just goes, <laughs> throws them. He goes, you don't need those. I was like, okay, well, there's a day's work, but you know. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. But that makes for good TV too. Because Absolutely. Because it created... Absolutely. Even the the absence of you coming up with the fake notes, you wouldn't have had that great moment when he was ripping that up exactly, and creating exactly. some great TV. Um, and then Ted Nugent was another guy who was exactly like... So he's an asshole. <laughs> well, look, I, I, let's just take the politics aside. Yeah. Um, he's when I, generous. Yeah, and, but my meeting with him was really weird because what had happened was I was working on a late night show with Magic Johnson, the right. ill-fated, horrible uh, late night show. But um, I, at the time, I was also trying to create shows. And I, had, I saw, I read an interview with Ted Nugent, and it wasn't about the po political stuff. It was just him being outrageous. Yeah. And I just went to my agent, I go, Ted Nugent is such an outrageous talker. Like, I'd love to try to do a show with him. God did and not give him a filter. No filter, yeah. and uh, so my agent hooks it up, and like I write up this idea of a talk show with Ted Nugent and everything, and she hooks it up where she's like, okay, Ted's gonna be in LA, um, and they'll meet with you, uh, but he's only gonna be here on a weekend, and I go, I'll have a barbecue, and he can come to my house for a barbecue. <laughs> So she's like, okay. So me and my friends, I'm like, hey guys, want to have a barbecue with Ted Nugent? And uh, we just had a small 10 people or and something. And you made it all vegetarian, I'm sure. Yeah, I got the meat out for that one. Yeah. And uh, it's just so surreal to have him coming to my house and he's sitting in the backyard and we're sitting at a picnic table in my backyard and he's eating corn and he's got like this bushy mustache and he's like, hey Todd, this is some good corn. <laughs> and I, like my childhood self, again, right. my, my adult Double self with the politics. Double life, Gonzo, Cat's Cat. My, my childhood self is going like, 
Ted Nugent sitting here and eating my corn on the cob in my house. Like, I had a poster of him when I, like, what is he doing? Yeah. What am I doing here? And what is he doing here? So there's a lot of those moments where it's like, like I said, with Robert Plant, I was like, these are people I worshipped. And yeah. I can't believe I'm talking and to them. And it doesn't, I know, because I know you, it, it never goes away. It it's doesn't. not like you, you've been in the industry 27 20, years. 27 years. I was going to say 25. 27 years. And you'll still have the same childish Absolutely. looking. Childlike, not childlike. Ab yeah. ab you know, here's the thing, too, is I always say to people is once that goes away, it's time to get out of the business. Because that I do sense. have a lot of friends who are very cynical about it and they're like, who cares? And it's like, no, I come from a small town in the middle of nowhere you know, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, never dreamed in a bazillion years that I would be working here. It just wasn't even a concept right, to work right. in Hollywood. So I still, when I'm there, I still pinch myself and go like, I can't believe I'm sitting here meeting a hero of mine. Yeah, and I would, again, yeah. sometimes disappointed, but most of the time like, wow. This but but even when you're cool. disappointed, that's educational. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, you know, a negative experience is a good experience because it just helps you understand the human condition. Yeah. You might actually find yourself having empathy toward someone you used to think led this wonderful life, and you're like, wow, this person's locked inside this really bad place. Mm -hmm. And I see all their trappings of wealth and fame and all that, and I'm happier as a human than the person I used to worship. And that, you, you can grow from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you see, again, the, the artist side of them and the human side of them. Right. And sometimes those things, um, I worked a lot with um, Dweezil Zappa, Frank Zappa's son. And Dweezil's a very quiet guy. And I noticed whenever I would talk to him or do briefings with him or whatever, he always had his guitar in his hand and would constantly be noodling. Mm. And I realized it's like, okay, that's his thing. He likes connection to dad, comfort. too. And, and it's, his, it's his comfort level right. to have the right. instrument in his hand and constantly noodling on it, you know, as opposed to putting it down and talking like we're doing. Right. Oh, and right. I get I it. It's like, okay, that's his thing. And the other thing is, is you have to, um, you have to, if you have a quirky musician, you know, okay, so what are their quirks and what do they like, what don't they like, because we have to make the day go well for them. Right. So I did um, this huge show, the iHeartRadio Music Awards show, and it was a massive three-hour live NBC show. And you know we had Madonna and Taylor Swift and all these huge superstars, and Rihanna and all these people. And it was like, it has to go like clockwork. Like from the time they open the door to that car and they get in there, you better have like the path clear, you know, the the dressing room perfect the rehearsal on time. Now, they'll always be late, right. but you can't be late. And it strikes me that an event like that, a great day for you is when you are, you create a scene where you're invisible, where a lack of mistakes and a seamless presentation is a home run for you. Yes. Like in other words, if, if you have a breakout act, they wanna, you know, they wanna be larger than life and all that, but when you're putting a three hour, I know that event, that's a gigantic event, mm -hmm. the best job you could do is for people to not notice Todd's touch. Right. Because it was that seamless right. and that effortless. Well, and on that show, it was such a massive show. My main goals, I had a boss on that. Because even when I'm an executive producer, I always have somebody bigger than me or above me that I have to answer to. And on that one, he wanted me to handle the comedy, the, not the music. Um, he wanted me to handle Jamie Foxx, who was hosting the show. So I worked, I was Jamie's uh, person for that show. But I got to see, like, this the machinations that are required to put on those award shows are crazy like at rihanna i remember we were in a meeting they're like rihanna wants to come in on a full-scale helicopter on the stage so they had to scramble and find a helicopter that they could lower you know wow. uh, for her to get out of and but really who doesn't want to get onto stage in a helicopter i mean always you know. works as an entrance <laughs> i mean we did it with our band yeah remember that yeah. helicopter oh yeah yeah, yeah. So, listen, Todd, I want to yeah. thank you so much for coming and doing the show with sure us. Sure, this hasn't been too boring because it's not about guitars. Oh, uh, it, it was, it's very boring. We're going to, all the YouTube haters are going to come after us, but, you know, I owed it to you. That's what editing is. That's my yeah. edit sign. Edit yeah, me down. I like that. So, listen, I want to thank our dear friends at Riverview Studios. You know, we brought Todd in, and Todd was great enough to come in. We've uh, gone a full season here in Guitar Tells. We wanted Todd to cap off our season for us. Uh, season two is coming up. We have some really exciting stuff planned. Um, 
Many thanks to Riverview Studios. Come check out the studio if you have any video needs of any sort. Uh, as always, we want to thank Scott Guitar Assist Engel. We're planning a roundtable of guitar players and music promoters uh, to kick off season two. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube. That'll help us let you know when new shows are coming out. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Yeah.